Well, good morning. Thank you all for coming out on this very dreary and rainy day. But if there's one thing I can say about JCF, we're consistent. You can count on rain on a day we have an event. Absolutely. I, I think we're uh, nine out of ten times. Uh, but I, I really appreciate you taking time to be with us. I know there are so many events every single week, and we're glad that you chose to be with us today and to hear from this fabulous panel. Uh, before we get started, there's a few people I'd just like to recognize. First of all, uh, Amanda Nussbaum, uh, our attorney here at Proskauer, and I want to thank them for being so gracious and generous and hosting us here today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the trustees from JCF who are here, uh, Jennifer Liss, who is our trustee and the head of our marketing committee who helps us plan so many of these events, and our media past president, Karen Adler, uh, and also our CEO, Sue Dickman. So um, we, we had a lot of help putting together today's fabulous program. And I just wanted to mention uh, the folks who helped us on the planning, uh, our trustee Zoya Rains, Jean Kane, uh, Victoria Visitina, and Ariane Devane. Thank all of you for, for helping us put this together. As many of you know, Jewish Communal Fund is the largest Jewish donor advised fund and one of the largest of the non-commercial donor advised fund in the nation. We have grown to manage 3,300 funds and have approximately $1.4 billion in assets under management. But we could not have accomplished this without the help of many people, uh, including the advisors who act as our ambassadors and who refer their clients to JCF. So we want to thank you for all the goodwill that you've generated. Um, I also wanted to take just a few minutes before we get started to give you just a brief overview about JCF and our services and how we might be useful to your clients. Um, we are a public charity that facilitates charitable giving through a vehicle known as a donor advised fund. And the goal is to make charitable giving more organized and efficient. JCF streamlines charitable giving in a cost-effective manner by handling all of the record keeping and all of the administrative burden. And it offers great flexibility because a tax deduction can be taken at the time that the gift is made to JCF, but the donor does have flexibility in terms of the spend out, the grants that are made out to charity. And unlike the private foundation vehicle, there is no annual minimum distribution requirement. JCF also makes it possible for you to assist your clients in making investment recommendations for their charitable assets in the JCF fund from our fairly robust menu of investment options. And charitable assets in the donor advised fund do grow tax free. In addition, for a private client group, uh, those people who are maintaining a million dollar balance and above with us, they do enjoy enhanced investment options, including uh, a wide uh, range of asset classes and the ability to suggest uh, managers to be vetted who are not currently on our platform. So we do have the ability to vet you or someone you would recommend for your client. Um, Fund holders have a great deal of freedom to support the charities that they care about. Grants can be made to sectarian or non-sectarian IRS qualified charities. Um, also, you know, I hear in conversation with many of you an increasing concern about being able to protect the privacy of your clients. And JCF can really work with clients to secure their privacy and maximize confidentiality. Unlike the private foundation, donor advised funds do report in the aggregate, and individual fund holders are not subject to public disclosure. So JCF can be used together with a private foundation, or it can be an alternative to a private foundation, um, and it certainly can be a tool in the planning for a private foundation spend down. 
Um, and of course, I think most importantly, if your clients are looking to connect with a network of Jewish philanthropists, then JCF is the place for them. A portion of JCF's fees are earmarked for endowment, the special gifts fund, and significant grants are made every year to Jewish charities throughout the greater metro area. And a very significant gift is made annually to UJA Federation of New York. We hope to have the opportunity to help you serve your clients. Uh, and there's many staff and trustees here if you have any questions later on. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Lauren Young. Lauren is the money editor at Reuters, where she's developing personal finance, wealth management, and investing coverage for professional and consumer audiences. She previously worked at Business Week covering all aspects of personal finance. Before joining Business Week, Lauren was the senior writer at Smart Money. She also covered mutual funds and capital markets for Dow Jones News, where she was a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal. And I'll let Lauren come up and introduce our speakers. Hey, everybody. Good morning. So you can tell this is a Jewish event because everyone's flocked down to where the food is. But now I realize that it's going to be hard for you to see some of the speakers. So I'm just wondering, I don't know if, yeah, I don't want them, I don't, you know, or if I can take a mic and walk, that would be the other question. So sorry about the logistical questions. I'll get started, but I'm mindful that I'm blocking your view to the cool people. And the cool people are Alexandra Liebenthal. Alex, um, Alexandra has been working basically in the investment community your entire life because um, her, a family business that was started by her grandparents, which many of you have heard of, which is Liebenthal & Company. Um, you went on to run that company before it was sold, and now she's been in the wealth management space, I guess, your entire life. Um, so Alexandra's over here. Um, and then we have Kay Koplovitz. Kay is just one of those super cool women who I think could get anything done. And I'm so glad that you're not at USA Networks anymore, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Westminster Dog Show is moving to Fox. It's terrible. And it's terrible. It's right. If you're a dog lover and you've watched the dog show like I have, so I can't blame you and I'm really happy about that. But you can read their bios around the table, there's, so there's plenty to read about them. Um, yeah, I'm funny. It's early. Uh, so uh, the panel is just about are you prepared? What we want to do is have a conversation today about how these women think about their money and um, just some advice that you can take away because you're going to be dealing with hopefully lots of very, very successful women who are going to want to invest money with you. And you're going to get to like pick the brains of two super successful ones to hear what they want and what they need from their financial advisors. So you guys have heard the data, but I'm just going to repeat it for you. Women in the U.S. control $5 trillion of wealth. There's this giant wealth transfer that's happening now. We all know women outlive men. Um, and so at some point, the patriarch leaves the money to the matriarch, and hopefully the job that you're doing now helps her prepare to, to have that transfer happen. Um, more than half of the women with investable assets of $1 million think that their financial advisor doesn't understand them. Less than 25% of financial advisors are women, which is the same percentage as a decade ago. And 70% of women leave the family's financial advisor after their husband dies. Those statistics are not working in your favor, people. Um, I would love the two women here just to talk a little bit about your journey and tell me how you got to where you are. So why don't we start with you, Alexandra? And I might need to move the mic a little bit, too. Why don't okay. we let me stand, stand up, up there? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Because I actually can't good. see anyone. On right, the side of the room. okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I've, I've had a long journey, uh, and the journey really precedes me by my grandmother as co-founder of the firm um, back in 1925. And the reason why my grandmother was so important in my life was she actually worked until she was 93 years old. And so she was very much a role model for me and still somebody that, that I think about 
quite frequently. Um, as a matter of fact, we started a, a magazine for female financial advisors and named it after her. Um, but my journey began in 1986 when I worked at Kidder Peabody in the municipal bond department for two years and then was enticed to go and join the family business and kind of never left it, although the business has changed significantly. I started as a financial advisor. I went on to have various roles, running our mutual fund department, running our sales department, and then became CEO uh, when I was 31. Um, not sure I knew a lot about how to be a CEO, but uh, realized that I had great people around me and having their expertise was going to make me successful and the firm successful. Uh, the firm had always been basically a municipal bond firm and I converted it into a full service wealth management business. And then as was mentioned before, I sold that company in 2001 and for four years stayed with parent companies, three as a matter of fact, until we were sold to Merrill Lynch in the fall of 2005, at which point I said I don't think this is for me. Uh, and and really didn't like the way the book ended um, with Labenthal ceasing to exist. And so I restarted the firm in 2007, uh, got my brother to join me who'd been at Goldman Sachs and a small money management firm. Uh, my brother's an equity manager. And we have built up over the last eight years in asset management and wealth management. And we also have a capital markets division that because we're a woman minority designated firm, we get included in a lot of transactions, mostly debt, but some IPOs, and that business has been tremendously successful. Um, you know, as I think through my journey and dealing with clients originally, but now being in touch with women, I am so passionate about the need for women to be educated and empowered. And for those of you who are advisors, you all know how they respond, that they don't know anything and their accounts are too small, et cetera. And I just believe that women actually have the tools um, to, to be strong and empowered. And I think that's really, as I look back on my life and my life going forward, that's really the thing that I'm I'm sort of designated to do um, as being the the, the um, descendant of my wonderful grandmother. So that's the brief overview. Thank you. Just to go ahead. Yeah, sure. we're informal now. <laughs> Good morning. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. Um, it begins with a serendipitous moment uh, when I was still a college student. And um, I'm a very big believer in, in serendipitous moments of life that maybe change the course. And here's mine. I was a student uh, going into my senior year at the University of Wisconsin, and I had been working three jobs, working my way through school. And I said, I've got to get out of Wisconsin, uh, see what's in the world. And I took my backpack and went to London and on to Europe um, for a month just to sort of, out of satisfy my curiosity. And while I was there, I was walking down the street and saw this poster for a lecture on satellites. Now, there weren't that many 20-year-old women who would have said, oh, boy, I can't wait to get in there and hear that lecture on satellites. But to me, wow, it was like a magnet. Because I grew up at a time when we had Sputnik, and when I was a grade schooler, and Sputnik was like, oh, the Russians launched the satellite. And then we had President Kennedy, who challenged us to put a man on the moon. And I was in outer space, I guess, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> went into went in to hear this lecture on geosynchronous orbiting satellites at 22,300 miles above the Earth in 1966. Now, some of you remember 1966, I guess. A few in the room probably do. Uh, but we have to go back to that time. It was the Cold War. You remember we had the Berlin Wall and we had the Great Wall of China. We don't have a Berlin Wall now, and Great Wall of China is to bring people in, not keep them out. Um, it's a very different time. And these satellites, these geosynchronous orbiting satellites, could transmit signals anywhere on Earth. Only three of them were needed in what was geosynchronous orbiting satellite meant it could be appear to be stationary, stationary over one place on Earth, and only three of them were needed to circle the globe. Real breakthrough at that time. And I was so compelled by the idea of the power of these satellites 
that I left that lecture being given by someone I think most people in the room would recognize, Arthur C. Clarke, the great science fiction writer, but also a great scientist, who wrote about geosynchronous orbiting satellites coming out of the Second World War in 1945, the year I was born. So I uh, really could never, that idea would never let me go. And I was thinking I was going to go to medical school in brain research, and I went into satellites and wrote my master's thesis on satellite communications in 1968, pursued that uh, for the next seven years because the market wasn't ready for these satellites to be launched yet as a commercial entity for the United States. They're being launched by governments to use them, but not for commercial use. And then we came upon the night that changed the course of television history, and that was September 30th, 1975. And what was that? I bet you know what that is, too. The Thrilla in Manila. It was the third boxing match. Maybe some of the women don't follow boxing, but that is the greatest boxing match, heavyweight boxing match of all time. And it, uh, we brought that live from Manila, 90,000 miles around by satellite to Vero Beach, Florida, and demonstrated how satellites could really be used for commercial use to bring television into people's homes. Um, that was very exciting at the time because then we didn't have all these things like your smartphones and your <coughs> faxes and your internet and you know, all the kind of communications we have today. We didn't have any of that. Um, and even cable television was just an antenna system in the mountains to get signals. It was nothing. So it was really the launch of my career. And I went on to launch uh, what became USA Network, brought all the major sporting events to cable before ESPN, uh, really grew out of industry. And I think it's anyone that started in the beginning of an industry and got to transform it or got to be one of the key people that transformed an industry, it's exhilarating. It's exhilarating for an entrepreneur. It's exhilarating experience with a lot of ups and downs, days that are hard and days that are totally you know, rewarding and exhilarating. And anyway, I won't go on a long time about what happened there. I built out that, the Sci-Fi Channel. I launched later on, uh, in part because I knew there would really, well, motivationally, I knew it would be a success uh, as a commercial success. But I also wanted to pay homage to <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury, two of my favorite science fiction writers. So very successful in that, you know, I think the most important thing that we did during that period of time was we, we really established the business model for cable television networks with two revenue streams. Uh, and that was really why cable television networks are today so successful um, as commercial entities. But when leaving that, what I decided to do when I left that in the late 90s, <coughs> It was sold for four and a half billion dollars. Uh, it, I really looked around and I didn't see the women. Like, where are they? Where are the rest of the women? What, what are they doing? And I decided, President Clinton at the time asked me to chair the National Women's Business Council. And I said, oh, that doesn't really float my boat. I like to do big things. Um, and, but okay, report to Congress. I can do that, but that's sort of boring. And I thought, well, uh, that's okay. If I can use that platform to get women into private equity, now that would be something. Now that's where the money is. We want to get women where the money is. And so for the last years since, well, now the last 18 years, I've been working to bring women entrepreneurs to market to fund their businesses in venture primarily. And there are a lot of similarities when you try, when you're teaching people, scientists and technologists to bring companies to market to raise outside capital, a lot of similarities to providing advice to them in terms of how to invest their money. Because we can talk more about the similarities, but just briefly, it takes time. You have to have patience. Women love to learn together in groups. It's trust. Trust has to be built over time, and you have to have patience to do that. And to date, we've brought 600 companies through our nonprofit accelerator called Springboard Enterprises, 
and we've raised over six, $7 billion uh, with these companies. Um, it's changing the landscape and creating women who are earning their own wealth. It's an exciting area to be, and I'll just leave it there. We can Excellent. answer some questions. What do you think? Alan's coming. So, if it's in Instead of yeah. moving out, you move the chairs in front. I was thinking about that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So okay. that's another. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to move the chairs in front so you can see the panelists. And I might even see if I can pull this back. Can I pull this back a little bit? Yeah, it's okay. Fine. You don't want to mess it up. Okay. Okay. I just want to. I want everybody to be happy. Okay. So I'm going to give the mic. Alexandra, I'll let you hold it. I trust you. That's perfect. Yay. All right. Can everyone see better? Better. Okay. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much to our building people. Um, Alexandra, what motivates you? Like, what is it that, why are you so interested in money and women? What is it? You know, it's funny. There are times when I think, how did I end are up? two of his favorite things, ladies and gentlemen. How I heard did that. I? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are times when I think, how, how is it that I'm in this business? Because it wasn't something that I thought about growing up and have a lot of other passions. And had I not gone into the family business, who knows what I would be doing right now. But I am so passionate about women, as I said before, being educated and empowered because I see so much fear, um, lack of confidence, concern, and one of the other things I find is that so many women immediately say, I hate my financial advisor, and don't realize that they have the power to find the right person for them. And so if I can help be a, a tool, a vessel in helping them, understand how much they really have, then that's something that drives me so much and really do consider to be part of my life's work. The other thing that definitely drives me is my legacy, is what my grandparents did and my dad, who created an amazing brand for 40 years. Um, I neglected to mention that not only did my grandmother work until 93, but my dad worked until 86 and on the last day of his life was in the office. and active and lived an amazing, amazing life and really was an inspiration to everyone he he touched. Um, so it really is the 90 years of that name and everything that has gone into that. Hey, what motivates you? Curiosity. <laughs> I'm an adventurer in life and, in, you know, everything I kind of do, but I, I think what really motivates me is helping now working with uh, people who are looking to build their businesses. I, I really, I, I started off as a creative person and then I realized that business was creative and I fell in love with really building big sustainable businesses. And, and so what motivates me today is looking at all these women who are in the areas of technology, in our case technology and life sciences, who have really great experience are bringing it to the forefront and really going the long route and can stick with it and I, I, the performance is so fantastic when they have the ecosystem around them like advisors, Alexander's advised uh, some of our companies uh, in the Springboard group and, and it's really important to create the ecosystem around them and it drives me to be able to make it bigger, stronger every day and so that's what motivates me. We talked a little bit about the wealth transfer, and, and, and it's obviously something that everybody's thinking about. Um, the, the other fun stat is that by 2054, $40 trillion in wealth will be passed on, and much of that will fall into women's hands. And I would like some of it, by the way. Um, <laughs> half of it, yes. I like this guy. Um, so what can we do to financially empower women? It's not just giving women money, making sure that it's in their hands, but what can we do to empower them, Alexandra? You have the microphone. Well, I mentioned briefly in my initial remarks about women um, not having confidence when they talk to their advisor. And, you know, there's the standard, I know I'm bothering you. I know my account is too small. I'm sure you don't have time. I have a really dumb question. And what I always tell women is that there's a way to express that 
but in an empowered way. Um, so to say, I'm a novice investor. I have some basic questions. I would like to come in and meet with you. Um, I have this is how much I have to invest. You know, sometimes women say, I know my account's really small, and they'll say it's $5 million. And <laughs> no, that's not small at all. Um, but I think for an advisor to also recognize, and women do tend to be very good at this, um, to, rec to recognize those moments when the woman has lost the train of the discussion and it's easy to tell, you know, there's, a, there's an eyes glazing over, there's a body language change, and to stop and say, you know, I'm going to repeat that. Um, I want to make sure you understand it. Uh, the other thing, and this goes to the 70% of, of widows and divorcees uh, seeking new advisors within the first year, is to develop a relationship with the woman while she's married, even if it's typically the husband that one deals with. And to say, you know, we really need to bring your wife into this. I'd like to sit down with her on a quarterly basis so she understands you never know what might happen because if you have that relationship before the life-changing event happens, the greater the chance that you are going to keep that client. Well, I, I agree with what Alexandra said. I think that my experience in, I mean, grew up in the business with all men. And I, and it's a different behavior pattern. Um, and last 18 years, primarily working with a lot of women, I see the difference in really that building that trust over time. And you can't start early enough. Because women are really curious, they want to be educated, they want to learn and understand once you get them to the table. And I, I think it really helps oftentimes to have even small groups of women together who are all asking and questions and hearing the answers to other people's questions because a lot of times they're the very similar questions that they have and other people ask them and it really is a helpful thing. You know, guys are more one-on-one, -on -one, pull the trigger, yes, no, I don't, you know, I like it, I don't like it. It's, it's much easier. I, I have a little bit more of that personality myself, but I, I really have learned that being early on, and I think when you're talking about 2040, today, it's not only the person who is maybe inheriting worth or wealth or retiring with their own earned wealth, I think much younger I think talking to women, young women, when they're coming out of school and really helping them along the way, even with small things, um, is really, I think, going to be important for them to be feeling confident as they gain, earn more wealth, that they are the people that can oversee it. And I think you'll see that. But I think it takes that kind of education long term. Great. So currently only 34% of ultra-wealthy females are self-made, as opposed to those who inherited some or all of their wealth. And by 2040, 55% of women will be self-made in that group, so the, the, the ultra-wealthy women. For you ladies, and I'm not going to make any assumptions about who inherited and who's self-made, but what do you think the differences are between someone who inherits money and someone who makes it on their own. Okay, well, for, ask, go ahead, for, Alexander. Go I was ahead. just going to say, first of all, hopefully many of those will have come from Springboard yeah. <laughs> Enterprises and companies that are... Well so we've got some real good candidates. <laughs> which is great. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because there are a lot of women who are incredibly smart, who run their own businesses or who are senior partners in law firms who um, exhibit a lot of the same lack of confidence that other women do. Um, but I do think with the ultra wealthy woman, you know, who's in the tech business, she's more savvy, perhaps, um, and interested in a broader range of investments, including 
venture capital investing in women-owned businesses and you know Springboard was really the the pioneer in that and has led to so many other things like Golden Seeds and Angel Networks of Women um, and I think that women who have a lot of money that have made it on their own do really have a passion in investing back into other women. Yeah, I, I do. I do agree with that. Um, the other thing that I see uh, is that of inherited wealth. Uh, the third generation in that family, oftentimes today, I'm talking about the 35-year-old, the 40, the 45-year-old woman, uh, is interested not only in what she cares about, her passions, and what she's going to do with her philanthropy. She cares about how she can invest in companies that support the same outcome. And I'm seeing more of that. It's an interesting, uh, when you talk about socially responsible investing, that third generation, second, um, but mostly third generation inherited wealth group is decidedly different than their parents. And, I, and I'm seeing that kind of across the board. And I don't know if people are shaking their head if you see that, too. But that is a very interesting layer that is evolving, I think. How would, uh, how would you tap into them when you're dealing with younger women entrepreneurs? How do you understand their ethos? Well, uh, I, the way I have understood it is I've been asked to speak about some things that I'm supporting that are philanthropic, maybe, but also investing. I'm doing the both, the philanthropy and investing behind something that supports the same philanthropy goal. And when we talk about that, and you're talking to a group of people who are in that category of high net worth individuals but that have inherited their money, you, I really, you, they, they gravitate to you and you know, they start talking to you about what, what they want to achieve. And they're willing to achieve it both with philanthropy and with you know, invested behind it. So you can only do it by getting out there and, and circulating and finding out what are they really interested in? What do they really want to do? And helping them understand a variety of ways in which they can achieve it. Um, and I think this is a fairly new get a convergence of philanthropy and investing that is going on, especially, like I say, in these maybe third generation inherited wealth. I think that women have earned their wealth. We see it all over the country. Uh, groups of women that are investing together in early stage, um, you know, companies that are seed stage. You know, they're investing. Maybe they've committed. I belong to one of these out of the Midwest that I also started. This, you know, we each committed $100,000 to the fund, and we look at the companies together. Learning how to do the due diligence and things is really very important to do. That's another movement that we see all across the country. So things are changing a bit, I think, and you have to be in the market to understand. You have to go to some of these events to understand how it's changing. Alexander, what are the key differences in between men and women when it comes to money? You know, I keep saying lack of confidence and not being empowered, and that is the biggest thing. Um, you know, men tend to, whether they understand it or not, just dive right in and tend to be more focused on the investments and what the return is. Um, women are more focused on their long-term goals and needs, and it's so important to communicate with a woman based on that, starting with her goals, how much she needs to live on, what kind of return or investments, therefore, she needs to be in instead of start out with, you know, we're going to do a third equities, a third bonds, a third cash, and, you know, start using a lot of jargon. Women get very confused by the jargon, and I think for people in the industry, it's hard for us to sometimes remember that we do speak our own language. And um, it's not, it's not, it's like French. And if you don't know French, you know, you're not going to be able to understand um, a lot of what we say. But I do think it's, it's that, that definite lack of confidence and that men are more focused on the investments versus the long-term goals. Okay, he's grabbing that microphone. Well, <laughs> so I've, here's a little bit of the elephant in the room. Um, every woman can envision herself as a bag lady. You don't matter how much money. A bag lady. A bag, a bag lady on the street, you know. 
begging for money. And, and, and there is a little bit of that. I think almost all women have, a, no matter what their resources are, have a, you know, the fear of becoming a bag lady. Something bad's going to happen, and they're going to be a bag lady out on the street begging. So I think that you know you sort of have to overcome the fear that something like that uh, brings to people in women's minds. I don't think men go into anything thinking they're going to be a bag man on the street, although there are two of them that sleep right in front of the Dakota where I walk past every day uh, at night. So two, two men who are sleeping bag men who sleep out there every day. But I mean. I think that's the kind of fear aspect that women need to overcome. And it, you see it, women have ultra-high net worth and women who are out there working. It's just the same sort of fear. So it's America Saves Week this week. Did anybody know that? Welcome. Happy America Saves Week. Um, and yesterday I participated in a Twitter chat that Fidelity sponsored, and they said, what motivates you to save for retirement? And I said, it's not eating cat food in my retirement, right? So <laughs> it's funny that you say that. Um, it's true. So can you guys talk a little bit about who manages your money and what, how you navigate that landscape? Um, my brother, it, who works with me, as I mentioned before, is an equity portfolio manager, so he really does it. Um, I, my husband and I also have our own things that we, you know, equities that we have a particular interest and passion in. Um, I would say I'm perhaps a little bit of the shoemaker's elves in that um, I'm not as, is that the right expression? I can't think. Um, children, right. Um, that I probably um, don't have as good a financial plan as our, as our clients do. <laughs> Well, it's a complicated question um, a bit. Uh, one of our colleagues here in the room absolutely knows the time when 19, the crash of 1987, if those rem if you remember October of 1987. Um, my, uh, my husband is really very much into the liquidities in the marketplace, and we were in London at the time when the market dove 508 points and got the call with uh, everything crashing down in the liquid markets and we're left with nothing except a home we owned in the desert in California. So I, you know, it was a really tough lesson to learn uh, to take charge of your own. So I too have learned <laughs> the lesson of taking charge of one's own portfolios and they're very, we both invest. Um, my husband and I still both do investments. There's mostly liquidity spread across um, real estate and some other things, but really and have advisors um, who give us advice. I didn't myself really, I was not really successful in some of the structured products that advisor, advisors uh, advised me to take, you know, into, uh, invest into, and, and uh, so you learn. But I, I'm not afraid to take, I have illiquid investments and in venture and different things. It's a very diverse portfolio, and I feel that for me and for our resources, it's the best. And it's the best that we each have some of our own portfolios. So I think people, you know, I'm a, a candidate for, you know, a good advisors because I do accept people's advice. Um, but I think also I'm, you know, very much in control of what I want to see in my portfolio today. Do both of you talk about money a lot with your significant other? Um, yeah. I mean... My husband's in the business too, so it's it's hard not to, basically. And do you talk about your investments specifically? Like oh you say, yeah, like we're moving into this fund or whatever, and yeah, that's why. Yeah, definitely. Um, Who drive? Do you drive that conversation, or does uh, it's, he? Or is it it's both? both. It's both. We have two particular stocks that we spend a lot of time talking about. Um, and uh, but no, it's it's hard not to when your husband's in the business as right. well. And do you spend a lot of time talking about those stocks because they're just interesting companies or you don't know what one, to do with them? One is a very interesting company that we've been involved with for a long time. The stock has been a little bit crazy. We know the CEO. We believe in him. And it's always about, you know, should we do more? Should we sell? We believe in it. Actually, separate from donor-advised funds, it has been, because we originally bought it at $0.62 cents and it went as high as $19 at one point, it has been a great source of charitable gifts for us. 
Um, and the other is actually a big um, piece of the company that my husband used to work for. Um, and there's some emotion around that stock and what to do with it. Interesting. You talk with your significant other a lot about money in, in like specifically invest, investments and we're doing this or we're not doing that? Yes, we, we do talk about it a lot. Um, my husband's really involved in, you know, a whole, he spends most of his time doing that now. He's reti he's a retired lawyer. Um, so, um, you know, yes, we do talk about what we want to do. I mean, uh, we were just talking about how much we love to travel in Canada a few months ago, and we said because we we're, we're hikers, we like to hike uh, altitude and stuff, and and white water after. So we um, we spent a lot of time in the Western Rockies, and and we were saying, gee, you know, look at the American dollar against the Canadian dollar. It's a good time to buy Canadian dollars. <laughs> so. Here we're piling up our Canadian dollars, you know, at uh, 138, 139, 140, 132, you know, something like that. And it's a silly sort of thing, but it, in a way we, we do talk about little strategies like that. And we say, well, well you know, this will be great. When the Canadian dollar strengthens, we'll, we'll have all these Canadian dollars, you know, to, to spend um, on our trips. <laughs> so we do little things. Uh, Alexandra, who is more fee conscious, men or women, or do they approach it differently? Fees are the big hidden mystery, um, and there's so many different types of fees depending on the investment that you're buying. Um, bonds being one of the most elusive because bonds are bought wholesale at one price by the firm and then sold retail with a markup. And I just read the other day that um, there is a proposal to actually uh, reveal markups, um, which I think is very meaningful. Um, I think men are more uh, aggressive about asking for a discount uh, in fees than women are. Um, women just tend to say, okay, fine, whatever it is. Um, but it's, it's so important for women to ask about fees to have a whole separate discussion, almost a tutorial about fees for managed accounts, mutual funds, hedge funds if they're in them, bonds, buying stocks on commission, and just understand the whole landscape. Yeah, I, I, I can't really add much to that. I think there's, there is, I think everybody's an individual, so I don't think our men fall all into one category and women fall all into another category, but generally speaking, um, men are make a decision faster. Um, you know, they'll 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 push for discounts. They'll always want a good deal. Um, these are some of the characteristics I think women are beginning to learn, but are much more resident to do. You know, they they don't really want to uh, push the envelope on that. They'll accept the information that they're getting. I think that's a, all. Those things are are generally true. So. What do you think needs to happen to get more women taking charge of their money at any age? What what would it be? You talked well, a little bit about younger women. I'm yeah, curious. And, and actually, I totally echo that um, because a lot of young women don't even understand that they should start with their IRAs as soon as possible, take advantage of the 401k as soon as possible. And it's not like companies give them a tutorial about here's your 401, here's what a 401k is, here's why tax deferral is good, and and reducing your taxable income. Um, I don't think that the financial media that is as exists right now is particularly geared towards women and the way they think, so I think there's an opportunity there. The one main exception I would give is Consuelo Max Wealth Track, which is on PBS uh, on Friday nights, I believe. Um, but it's, it, look, I, there are certain authors who have been wildly successful in promoting financial freedom and empowerment. And while I, I and I'm not going to name any names, I don't agree with that person per se, but she Neither has do I. been, she, she ha, it's amazing how many women have really responded and her message has resonated. Um, I will mention another author by name, Jean Chatsky, who has done a tremendous job through all of her books 
and through her appearances on the Today Show. Um, but it's really the other thing that's important is for parents to get their kids involved really as early as possible in understanding what investments are. And and you can do that with a really young child by explaining that Happy Meal from Did from McDonald's is actually a company and you could own a little piece of that company. Um, so it's really the education, financial literacy, and a lot of schools are really starting to realize how important that is. You know, <clears throat> I agree with you. I, I remember as a child I had a bank account and, um, and I would go put my allowance or earned money uh, in my bank account and they would put it in there on the line, and you could see your bank account, you know, the, the grow, and you'd get little stars, different colored stars. It, it was, you know, I'm five years old. I'm six years old, seven years old. But it was teaching me at a very early age about the value of saving, saving up for, and then you could spend, do something you wanted with it. And I don't think that enough parents realize the power of that, and I don't think that banks today want to have all these little passbooks that kids put their stars in. But And, and I do think that plastic money and so forth has uh, obfuscated a lot of the responsibilities and what in, you know what interest charges are and when you compound interest. Char I, I think there's a whole, at, you know, school level of, of middle school and high school that kids come out of high school and don't even understand any of these basic things, that's really, I think, would really be, I know that's not your client that you're going after today, but I do think that if there's a way to support the programs that are doing that, that will help a lot. And I and also was thinking about the corporate world, Alexandra, because on the way over here today I was thinking, well, what would what would move the needle? significantly for wealth advisors getting more access to women. And I think that corporations uh, for their employees have health uh, you know, ha um, insurance and things like this. But I also think that financial literacy programs for people coming into their first, second, third jobs in corporations could really have a benefit from an education course on financial literacy because they don't. They come into the marketplace and don't really know a lot of them. You know, more, if they, they, a lot of them think they'll never own a home. They could never get to that. They don't know how to really save up for it. They don't really understand the mortgage process. I mean, there's just so many things that were just basic that if corporations would offer that to employees, I think it would help women at a young age. So for people in the room who offer financial advice, would you, and I'm sure some of you do this already with your clients, but should you be talking, how do you address the younger generation? Do you bring them into the office? Do you meet them at Starbucks? I mean, what did it, how do you get them on your radar and vice versa? What would be your advice, Alexandra? Uh, well, I'm actually thinking of a particular case where my brother had a client, and it was a family, it was a friend of ours as well, and he brought the 19-year-old daughter in, and she really appreciated it um, and, and took a lot out of it. Um, it. You know, it's hard because I don't completely understand the millennial generation, um, although I have a 22-year-old, so I guess he's sort of, sort of one. Um, so perhaps meeting in a different environment, it's actually interesting that you mentioned that, um, is a lot easier and more comfortable for them rather than coming into, you know, the Merrill Lynch office or the, um, you know, big tall building where they're going to probably feel somewhat overwhelmed. Um, so. We just did a story about, uh, um, because it's tax season, obviously, there's a financial uh, a CPA who's set up shop in Williamsburg, like in a bar, and he's for hundred dollars an hour. You can go sit down with him, and he'll give you, you know, do your taxes for you. So it's the same idea. I mean, I'm not saying that you guys all need to run to Williamsburg and go sit up in a in a bar, but it was it, it kind of echoes what you said. Okay, what would you say? How would like how you know? Because here, like it's it's a little disingenuous in some ways. I want to meet with your 19-year-old daughter. Come bring her into the office. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what would you? What would be, be your advice? Can you me? What would be your advice? You know, how do you get the hook? Because you're like good at hooking audiences. How do I hook that audience? You know, I I think there's a a gamification 
uh, application in this education process for younger people. Uh -huh. um, there is a company that, that I did have an investment in called True Office, uh, which is a compliance, uh, a gamification of the compliance process. Um, it sold to the New York Stock Exchange at a very early stage. But it, it, in helping the uh, CEO develop that company, um, it went from sort of a comic book type publication to a game. And people learned in compliance issues much more from playing the game than they did from taking the surveys that they used to have to take and filling out these surveys because they just were bored with surveys. It was multiple choice and out. The game uh, was real life situations and, and they were based on things ripped from the headlines that people related to. And I think this is how to get to young people because they grew up, they've grown up with playing games. Games are, are in, they, don't, they don't have to be complicated. They're not shoot up games. They can be done in five minutes type games. Um, but I think there's an education process that would be wonderful to, you know, have that kind of education available um, through gamification so people learn and have fun doing it, maybe earn points doing it, doing things that relate to how they relate to the marketplace, not how we relate to the marketplace, and but know, how they do. And I know both of you said, you know, you have to have the conversation with women while they're married before the transfer of wealth happens. But what what's the hook for women once they're on their own? How do you keep them because we don't, you know, 70% walks out the door. So what what do you think is the magic? I I think it's potion. You have to be proactive in calling them. They're not going to call you. You have to say it's time to come in or go meet at Starbucks um, for our what, quarterly meeting or at least our semi-annual meeting or annual meeting, some regular type of type of meeting. Um, you absolutely have to be the one who who reaches out. Um, and I think find also may, maybe just as I was talking about with a, um, my very young, a very young child, find creative ways to talk to that woman. And I'll give you an interesting example. So um, a few years ago, I wrote a novel called The Recessionistas, which was a satire and expose of Wall Street and New York society during the financial crisis, somewhat autobiographical, but um, in the which was sold to USA Networks, and I'm glad you're not there because they just dropped it. Um, <laughs> So we're looking dogs <laughs> and your book. This is not yeah. Right. So we're looking for we're looking for a new home for it, and the script is written, and it's wonderful. But anyway, um, in the book, I explain the whole financial crisis and what CDOs are. And my husband said it's the only chick lit book that explains what a CDO is. And I did it through fiction, through conversation between two characters, and. Um, Elle magazine at the time was doing a story on it and it was a 25 year old girl who was doing the story and she said, you know, I totally understood everything that you were talking about and it's the first time I've understood it. So if you can talk in stories, exactly. that really makes a big difference. Exactly. And, and the book's available on Amazon too. <laughs> <laughs> it's an intriguing read too. You should probably run out and get it. Um, yeah. So I, I think that you know, it, t when you try to reach people, you're talking about the women who's maybe are divorced or their husbands have died or whatever. And how do you keep them? I think that was your question. Um, you know, some of the most successful advisors I've seen are are really interested in what those women are interested in. So if they're interested in art, if they're interested in theater, if they're interested in um, finding ways to raise people out of poverty, if they're interested in helping children with autism. You know, it, it, there's, I think it's finding what their interests are and helping them, you know, get deeper into their own interests and getting to know them. It's a process. It's not like come in and sit down and you know, let's talk about your finances. That scares them off right away. I think Alexandra was very articulate about that. They feel dumb. They feel like they don't know the right questions to ask, and it's a, a, not a good feeling. Um, and I think that's I think that's really what you have to do. You have to cultivate people 
where their interests lie and you know really get to know people and what motivates them and what will make them feel secure because I think women are concerned about being secure you know for oh, how long they don't know but maybe a long time and I think that, that, that and you know we we have a disparity in earned power so women that are earning their own money today still earn less and retire with less and you know there's there's a whole train of things that are they're dealing uh, with long-term needs that they're starting with a lower base uh, what to use oftentimes that's different from someone who's inheriting a great deal of wealth but these are all factors in the marketplace and I think in each case uh, what I detect when I work uh, a lot with women is really building that trust over time they're not gonna meet somebody and say that's it I'm pulling the trigger I'm gonna do whatever they say that just women just don't do that you've got to really build trust over time so that's it's work Thank you. So we're going to move to the Q&A part now. Um, we have a microphone. Do we have another microphone, Ellen, or just the one up here? That's okay. You guys, you're loud. You can speak loud. Um, so I would love to call on people if anybody has any questions. Yeah, in the back. And would you mind identifying yourself, too? Sure. Uh, my name is Robert Deans with Brown Harris Deans. Hi, Robert Deans. Hi. And um, I have a 14-year-old daughter, and she's very interested in the Bitcoin market. Mm -hmm. She's Well, I do think that the wealth management business is actually... Do you guys actually, need me to repeat the question? Uh, yeah. So what his 14-year-old daughter is on her phone most of the time, and I can identify with that. Um, what, what are her future opportunities? I, I do think the wealth management business is an amazing business for women. Um, you're judged on your success and not judged. I mean, you're paid on your success. Um, and there are a lot of men who are advisors who realize, have started to realize that there's great value in having a woman on their team because she does communicate differently. And so I do think you're going to see a lot of women being sought after by male financial advisors to be a part of their team. But, um, you know, Wall Street still in general has a long way to go. Um, there are the one other opportunity which Kay can talk more about than I can is just the ability to be an entrepreneur and the access to how much easier it is to do that today with the internet um, and with uh, other other you know technological advances that make that easier. Well, I don't know your 14-year-old daughter, so I'm not sure what she's interested in. But you know, I think she lives in a world of infinite possibilities. And what I'd love to see you do is encourage her to follow the things that really interest her, because that's what she'll be successful in. So um, and never give up. You know, if you have a dream, uh, really. A lot of people say that, but it's so true. Keep pursuing the things that you really love because it's really much better to get up every morning and do something you really love than it is to just do something because you have to. So just give her an open field and let her go. Question? I'll go you and then you. Can you do, uh, do you mind saying it? That's a great question. Um, I We've talked about this at our own company, about having events and, and a series of events or a, you know program that a woman essentially joins um, that's not just a money manager, that's you know somebody in the private equity business to explain what that is I think they do have a d desire to learn or somebody in the financial media you know having Maria Bartiromo come in whatever it may be 
Um, and I do think that if you can come up with creative programs, they're going to respond to that. Um, and look, women do enjoy being together. So I, I, I've never really felt that it was talking down to women. I think that they, they want to take advantage of that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it has to be at a level of, you know, have an understanding of what the basic level is of what people in the room is, but really offering um, the kind of advice and the kind of, and, the, and the speaker who really can bring out the kinds of answer questions without even posing them for people in the room. So it's a real, people go away enriched, feeling that they really learned something. Um, is, is important, and, and women like to learn together. Um, I, I'm kind of thinking oftentimes, though, that it's great to have women and men in the room together because there, there are learned processes um, that, of how we, how, how we learn. So I think that sometimes, you know, understanding how we each think differently and learn differently in some situations is helpful. Um, so it's you know not always all women in the room, but I do th I do see that women recede from asking questions when men are in the room because they feel I'm going to ask the dumb question. I don't really understand. There's too much of that still among women. So that's why it is good to have women in the room together and really be able to learn together. But make sure it's really on a professional level what you're learning and not you're not feeling like you're you know, talk, know what the level in the room is and, and talk a little above that level so people can rise in their education. That's what I think you should do. Thanks, Kay. Question? Yep. Um, in a way, Wells Fargo, um, there's a lot of emphasis now on teaching women to STEM, uh, technology and math and so forth. And they go out in the workforce and they understand technology is almost a fad of Wall Street, so there's no women around. I see it changing um, slowly, but there are great high-profile changes that happen, like Ruth Porat going to Google. Um, and on Wall Street, the interesting thing is that there are some really powerful women in jobs that people aren't aware of. For example, the woman, the person who runs global equity capital markets at JP Morgan is a woman. The person who runs global equity capital markets at B of A Merrill is a woman. The person who runs investment banking at UBS is a woman. Um, and the person who runs global wealth management private banking at JP Morgan is a woman. And she's more high profile. That's Mary Erdos, who's phenomenal. Um, but what's difficult is you get these entry level women and then it's getting them past the level where they have a choice to leave, to have a baby and not come back. And I think Sheryl Sandberg uh, described it so well in her book that the important thing is to talk to those women before they have a child, even though HR may not like that. Um, but to say, you know, let's have a conversation. If you're going to have children, you know, you can handle this, and we want you back, and you have a great career ahead of you. Um, so there, there, it's it's frustrating. There's still is so much distance to go, but I do see, you know, great pockets of success. I see pretty much the same thing. I, I have to say, I'm not from the financial markets myself, um, but I belong to one of my discussion groups of women. is called Broads on Boards. Everybody is on a board and on different boards, and we talk about a lot of different things. I, I would say coming from the media business, which is very different and has quite a few uh, women running major companies in the media business, is very different in the financial business. And I would say that... My friends that have grown up in the financial business are the most frustrated, are the most angry still about where they have been sort of cut off um, in their careers in the financial markets. And I think that we need more success stories, more men and women sponsoring women coming up in the financial industries and really opening the door. There is a great 
book called The Athena Doctrine. I think it's a great book written by John Gazema um, that interviewed 64,000 people in corporations, financial and others, around the globe, men and women, and asking what are the re leadership qualities needed for the future in the 21st century. And the leadership characteristics that were most valued, country to country, even Korea and Japan, were the characteristics that people said were feminine characteristics. Collaboration, transparency, openness, uh, acceptance, um, you know, these sorts of things, communication skills. Not to say that there weren't male attributes, strength, decision making, etc. that were very, and the conclusion of the book is that around the globe people feel that the combination of both men and women making decisions improves performance of companies and now there are many studies that show that that the performance of companies of you know people working in and it requires more women in these top roles so it's just i think that's what we have to do we have to get more men and women sponsoring raising women in and in minorities inside these major financial institutions to understand how the world is really changing how look at the demographics of our country how vastly it's changed in our lifetime. And we've got to be able to deal with that. And we need everybody at the table. Great. That's my speech. Right Question over there. Um, yeah, when you were mentioning the, um, the issue of you know, human resources departments speaking to women before they had a child, um, do you see a, and then we were talking about the 19 year old who came into your office, do you see a role that? college career officers can play in helping women, you know, students who are looking into careers, how they're going to address that. Because I've spoken to um, my former college and you know, they say the students aren't really ready to think about, you know, they just sort of, I know I felt I could conquer the world when I was 19, 20 years old and wasn't really thinking about having kids. Um, you know, do you think there's a way to address it at that age? that they don't sort of give up, you know, when it happens. Did you guys hear it on the other side of the room? No. Okay, so the question, I'm going to just distill it, is on college campuses, can the career, the career placement office, can they already help have the conversation about having, for women, having kids, how to navigate a career? Mike, did I encapsulate that well for you? Yeah, I think Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, having never dealt with my own career placement office, I, it's hard for me to even know how that Has whole your process kid, works. Is your 22-year-old a boy or a girl? A boy. And did he do any he's, placement he's stuff on campus? He's a senior right okay. now, and he's not doing anything he's supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's called senioritis, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it might be hard for... Well, I don't know. I mean, it's actually a great, really creative idea, whether it's within career placement or whether it's within the Office of Student Life and preparing graduates for uh, their next stage. So it's very unique. And actually, somebody could start a business going in as a consultant and doing that even. So interesting idea. I want to tell you about a movement that's going on in some of the corporations, and you may not have seen it yet very much. But um, fertility clinic access has become a, a very big issue in the war and talent in the technology sector. And um, it's an acceptance of the idea that women want to control their own timing or their own period of whether they're single or married, whatever, it's becoming mandatory as a part of the um, offering of uh, a, a, a job offering uh, in that sector. And I think you're going to see more of it because I do think that women are delaying longer uh, oftentimes having children, having children more after 35, even after 40, um, and having the desire to freeze their eggs at a younger stage so that it's available to them. And companies, Wall Street included, I think are going to see more of this because it is, in the younger generation, an expectation 
that this will be available to them. The clinics and the ability to do it is all available, but the cost of it is very, quite considerable. And I, you know, this is an issue that is embedded in sort of the question that you asked about, should people be thinking about this at a younger age and how they're going to deal with it? I think I'm telling you they are, and both men and women in that coming out, the millennials on the leading edge of millennials are, have an expectation that this will be part of their planning process. Um, that's not everybody in the country, that's, I understand, but these are some people in leading corporations that I see, I just see this in the last three, four years evolving, and it's, it's interesting, I think, in terms of the kind of planning that people are thinking of doing at a young age. All right, we have one more question. Yep, in the back. Well, it, uh, let me just repeat the question. So it's when the transfer of wealth occurs and some, uh, someone becomes widowed, um, that first meeting, what, what really is the conversation that, that's valuable? Well, I don't deal with clients myself, so um, it's, it's not something I deal with. But it's, uh, I just know from dealing with women, it's not about, okay, let's get into the state and executor and all of that. It's just having a meeting of, okay, you're going to be okay. Let's, let's talk about everything that we need to think about right now and really becoming her, her, her friend as much as you can in a, in a professional relationship. And also, when you do get to the point where you're talking about specifics and, it's, and it's, it is possible, I think, to do this in the first meeting, is to you know, take it in stages and talk at the beginning about trying to figure out where everything is. And by the way, there is um, a company called Lasting Matters right now that is basically a whole um, online via, uh, site to store documents, to have lists of where everything is. So people should be thinking about using things like that before. But you know, really not jumping into the whole process, but just talking to her about taking it in steps and just, again, emphasizing you're going to be OK, and I'm going to be here to help you, no matter what. And give out your cell phone number, too, even though you may not want to get calls. It just gives that woman comfort. Yeah, I agree. I would say the same thing. Excellent. Ellen, you're going to come back up and... Uh... Absolutely. Good first step. Well, I think we need a big round of applause for our speakers and our moderator. It was a fascinating program. Uh, really covered a wide range of issues and I think gave everybody a lot of food for thought. Uh, we are so grateful to you for your time and we are so grateful to our community of advisors for your continued support of our programs and I hope we'll see you at future programs. And I would just also ask you, there's little cards on the table um, that talk about JCF and the advisor network, but there's a survey because we really do want to bring you the kind of content that you find most meaningful and engaging. So give us some feedback, and we are happy to try to program for you something that's really going to add value for you and your clients. And thank you again to Proskauer. This was really fabulous. Thanks for hosting us.